Greetings class. In this multimodal lecture, I'm going to be talking about the classical form of speech making. It's a structure that's still used by many writers to organize persuasive speech, even though it's been around for about 2,000 years. And you can make use of it yourself. I'm going to talk about the formal structure in general, and then I'll go through and talk in greater detail about each of its composite parts, trying to give you some tips about how you can write and perform these effectively. I'll also be illustrating each of them with video clips taken from speakers in the 20th and 21st centuries. So you'll have an idea about what it looks like when somebody's actually using these on the ground. Now, I'm not just putting this together so that you can have an idea about classical argument. I could do this for you in class. I want this video to serve as a kind of rough model for the work that I want you to do for, with your groups as part of your final group projects. You'll be putting together, as you know, a multimodal argument that you'll be presenting in front of the class. You want to put some thought into how you do it. And you want to take a look at this presentation and see what you like about it and what you don't like so much so that you can figure out what's going to be most effective for you. Before we get started, make sure that you have a notebook and pen handy for jotting down any notes that may come to you. So what is the classical speech form? It's a way of structuring an oration or prose argument so that its parts fall in a certain order. For the purposes of this lecture, a classical argument can be divided into six different parts. They are the exordium, the narratio, the partitio, the confirmatio, the refutatio, and the peroratio. We will illustrate these with examples taken from the following speakers. Jim Lentz, CEO of Toyota Sales USA, Antonin Scalia, Supreme Court Justice, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, William Crystal, Weekly Standard Editor, Angela Davis, Political Activist and Former Professor at UC Santa Cruz, Cesar Chavez, Farm Worker and Labor Leader. We'll conclude by looking at the work of two Presidents of the United States, the 40th President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, and the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. Let's examine the classical form in greater detail. Exordium. This is the opener, the attention getter, the part of the argument that reaches out and grabs your audience. It sets the tone for the rest of the argument, and it's your first opportunity to involve your audience with your topic. The exordium should build a bridge between your audience's interests and concerns and your topic. If possible, make your exordium audience specific. Know your intended audience and address yourself to their shared interests and concerns. Sometimes, an exordium will seem urgent and forceful, insisting on the importance and timeliness of the argument. At other times, the tone will be calmer, cheerful, or chatty. The rhythm and syntax here are usually less formal than in other parts of the speech. The tone you set at the beginning establishes a range of the tones your audience will expect you to maintain throughout. For this example, consider how Jim Lentz, as an executive salesman of cars, connects to his audience at the Climate One Summit hosted by the Commonwealth Club, a non-profit, non-partisan educational organization based in Northern California. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Now, let's imagine for a moment that a very strange thing happens to each and every one of you tonight. While you're fast asleep, all the cars on Earth disappear. Now, now, now. Unaware, you come out in the morning to get in your car and it's gone. There's nothing there and there's no sign that it ever existed. And you're not alone. Same things happen to all your neighbors. And you find out from the early morning news that the same things happen to every car and truck all over the world. What would you do? How would you get to work? How would you get your kids to school? How would you go to the grocery store or get rushed to the hospital? Suddenly, the American way of life that we all enjoy is completely gone. And what if there's no quick solution? Imagine the changes that you'd have to make, the strain it would put on your relationships, your pocketbook, and your future plans. Heck, imagine how you get your teenagers to the mall in the morning. And you wouldn't be alone because society as we know it would have changed to the maximum. 
Travel would be extremely difficult. Commerce strained, and you'd have limited options, and those limited options would become your new way of life. In short, our world would be turned upside down. Okay, well, we can snap out of this imaginary nightmare for now. Come back to the present, and everything's going to be just fine. When we're finished here tonight, your reliable car will keep you warm and get you home safely to your loved ones. And I tell this story because it vividly illustrates the crucial role the automobile plays in all of our lives. No other product in American life does so much for us. It's the key connection to our lifestyle and to our world. And since we can't live without it, we need to find a way to live with it in harmony with our environment and with our planet. And that's what I'd like to talk to you tonight. The vital impact cars make on our lives, the economy, and on our future. And what we as automakers are doing to make sure that they're a benefit and not a burden to society. First, let me just say that I'm very honored to speak to the Commonwealth Club of California. This is the first and the biggest public affairs forum in the United States. And in this world of rushed communication and sound bites, the Commonwealth Club is an oasis of sanity, clarity, and understanding. You provide a public service by showing us the value of face-to-face -face communications. And from what I understand, you're a heck of a lot of fun, too. I mean, where else can you come and hear the director of the CIA or discuss free economics? and learn how to reinvent your body from Deepak Chopra. And that's just the few speakers you've had in this last month alone. You helped make the Bay Area one of the foremost places for progressive thinking in the entire world. And I know this because I used to live up here. I managed Toyota's regional sales office from 1995 to 2000. And it was a marvelous experience for myself, my wife, and my two sons growing up.